want to share a, a word of passion. Do I sound passionate at this stage? I'm getting there, Jeremy. Do you reckon I can get a bit more passionate? Last week, Joel talked about passion, and I thought it was really interesting. I actually wrote something down at the end of the message. And uh, I said to my wife this morning, I'm actually going to read it to you at the end of this message because I believe it's actually a prophetic word for the church. So be waiting for that. A number of years ago, back in 2005, Rosalie and I went on a trip through England, uh, Wales, Scotland, and then we went across uh, into Europe and did a number of places in Europe. And uh, we found that as a part of that package, there was actually a detour into the Greek islands. Who wouldn't want to go to the Greek islands? So it was a three-day little excursion off to the side. And it gave us an opportunity to go to some places that I have read about in the scripture, but never ever thought I'd get to see. One of those, for instance, was the Isle of Patmos. Now I can hear a few people going, aha, do you know the Isle of Patmos was the place where the Apostle John was exiled and where he received all that that we find in the book of Revelation. So Rosie and I actually got to go to Patmos. In my mind, I thought Patmos was something about the size of Granite Island. I'd always sort of imagine it being a bit of a rocky island with not much on it. We get there and it's, it's probably 20 or 40 times the size of Granite Island. It's got several towns across it. It's got a harbour. It's quite actually an amazing place. Another part that we got to go was off, we actually landed on the shores of Turkey. Again, I never, ever expected to get there. But the shores of Turkey are actually in this book and they're in the book of Acts. And so we were t- taken by bus um, to a place called Cushatasi, um, which is on the Aegean Sea. And from there we went inland and we went to the ancient city of Ephesus. Now, you know there's the book of Ephesians in here, and if you read again in the book of Acts, it talks about Paul and the journeys that he made in going through Ephesus. And as we uh, got to Ephesus, we were taken to the amphitheatre. And again, it's mentioned, and we're going to look at it in a moment, in the book of Acts. And it's a huge big thing. Can we have that screen, please? If we can have that here. There it is. So you can see that it's quite a large structure. Uh, you can imagine people at the bottom where there's a few people walking around. Imagine some sort of performance going on or even someone standing there orating to the crowd. Now, you can see, if you look right to the very top of the slide, there are actually steps all the way up to the very top. And uh, as it was a, when Rosie and I arrived, it was something like 38 or 40 degrees Celsius. It was a really, really hot day. Rosie's down the bottom and she said, Frank, I'd like a picture from the top. You want me to go all the way up to the top? Could you please get a picture? So I staggered all the way up to the very top. I got up there. I got the camera out. I held it up and I pushed the button, but there was no click. And I pushed again, no click. So from the top, I walked all the way back down to the bottom. I said, Rosie, I think the batteries are flat. So we put new batteries in the camera. And I walked all the way up to the top again. Wait for it. I held the camera, I went with the button, and what happened? No click. I walked all the way down again. I said, Rosie, those batteries are flat as well. So we put more in. I, walked all... I made three trips up and down to get one photo. I will well remember this theatre, but this theatre has a part to play in the Book of Acts, and I want us to turn, if you have your Bibles or your iPhones or devices, to Acts chapter 19. And we're going to look at a story that looks into this particular situation. And so it says this, starting in verse 1 of Acts chapter 19. Here we go. While Paul was at Corinth, sorry, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. And there he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. So John asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptised into the name of the Lord Jesus 
And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied and there were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Have you noticed this expression occurs a lot in the book of Acts? In fact, if you look at Acts, you'll find in chapter 1, it starts out talking about Jesus doing all up in terms of speaking and acting towards the kingdom of God. If you turn to the very last chapter in 28, you'll find that it has Paul in his own place in Rome preaching about the kingdom of God. It's like bookends around this to let you know this is God being busy through his spirit, through his apostles in this world. And so it says in verse 9, but some of them became obstinate and they refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. Can you sense tension in the story? So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the area of in the province of Asia, which is modern-day Turkey, heard the word of the Lord. God did amazing miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Could you imagine hanky healing? It's really interesting thoughts that come out in this amazing book. Some Jews went around driving out evil spirits, tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed, and they would say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish priest, was doing this. One day the evil spirits answered them, Jesus I know and I know about Paul, but who are you? And then the one who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them and he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. And when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honour. And many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds, and a number of them that had practised sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And when they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. All this happened... After all this happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem and passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I've been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Aristus, to Macedonia and while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. So there's a lot happening, a lot happening for the kingdom in this particular place. And so when Rosalie and I arrive here, I am excited to be there because I knew this story. About that time, there was a, dis- a rose of disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of, of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. He called them together along with the workmen in related trades and said, Men, you know we received a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man made gods and no gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great god Artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. And when they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And soon the whole city was in an uproar. And the people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's travelling companions from Macedonia and rushed as one man into the theatre, the theatre that I showed you. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. And even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theatre. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing and some another, and most of the people didn't even know why they were there. The Jews pushed Alexander to the front and some of the crowd shouted instructions to him and he motioned for silence in order to make a defence before the people. But when they realised he was a Jew, they shouted in unison about, for about two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And the city clerk quieted the crowd and said, men of Ephesus, doesn't the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? Therefore, these facts are undeniable. You ought to be quiet and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed the goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and they are, there are proconsuls. They can press charges and if there is anything further they want to bring out, it must be settled in legal assembly. As it is, 
we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's events. In that case, we must not be um, able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. And after this, he dismissed the assembly. Now, that's quite a big passage, but you get the sense of the story. Paul and his friends have preached Christ into this area. People have become Christians. There's a turning away from idols, and so there is this sense of upset in the city that the very gods that they worship are now being discredited. And so there is a lot of feeling in this town. And as I want you just to have a look again at verse 29. It says, When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And so the whole city was in uproar. And they seized Paul's companions and rushed together as one man into the theatre. They rushed together. Now, I want you to keep that in mind. And we're going to flip now to another passage right at the very beginning of the book of Acts. So keep this sense of there's a lot of tension, there's a lot of feeling, there's a lot of passion in these people. Now, come over with me into book, into Acts chapter 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit in the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you heard me speak about, for John baptised with water, but in a few days you'll be baptised with the Holy Spirit. And so they met together and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of, um, sorry, the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. And while they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood there. Men of Galilee, he said, why do you stand looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, the day Sabbath walk from the city. And when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. And those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas the son of James. And they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus with his brothers. Now I want you to vision this scene. Jesus who has died, has, they've seen him crucified. They've seen the blood uh, wounds of his body. They've seen him taken down and buried And then there's this story going around that he's been raised from the dead and finally he starts to appear and everybody's amazed that he's been resurrected back to life. So there's something beginning to happen that is just stirring inside of them. And then comes this day where Jesus is standing with them and he's now taken up out of their sight. You can imagine being there in that situation, watching him bodily lifted into the clouds and then finally taken away and two angels there begin talking to, the, to you. You're one of those people. Imagine what's happening inside of you. Can you be in a situation like that and just be kind of, oh, that was fairly interesting. I wonder how we did that. Put yourself into that situation. What would be happening inside of you? Wouldn't your heart be stirring? Wouldn't you have a huge sense of awe and wonder? an incredible feeling inside of your bones. Don't you think you would have a degree of passion if you were there at that time? Now imagine coming down because the angels said you can't stand here all day gawking, there are things to be done, and you've gathered together into a prayer meeting. Tell me about the prayer meeting. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, look upon this little soul. How would you be praying? Don't you think you'd be praying with passion, with feeling, with strength, with power, with optimism, 
with faith. The interesting thing is there's one story of a crowd that is angry and passionate and there's another story of a crowd of believers in Jesus who have been touched by his, by his very presence and they're stirred up and they're passionate. And so there is actually in each of these passages where I word, read the word together, there's a word in Greek that is a lot stronger than just together. Now I wonder if we can get this up onto the screen. Here we are. In the, in the NIV Bible, the word in English is together, which is a very soft translation of the Greek of, that was the original language that this was written in. And this, this word, well, some say homothumadon, but it's actually probably more correctly pronounced homothimodon. Now, I ran into um, John. Uh, where's our fr good friend John the Greek? And uh, John said something interesting to me because we, we looked at this word and we pulled off the first part, the word homo. You have homogenous milk. What does it mean? It means milk that has been sort of churned up so it's even in consistency. It's the same all the way through. But then we have this word thymodon, which comes from the Greek word thymos. And I said to John, can you remember from the little bit of Greek you know what thymos means? And you said to me it means... Anger. It means anger. But he also said something else. He said, you know, the Greek that we use now is some of the words are what? Exactly opposite. And I said, that's interesting because, you see, this word thymos, as it was used in ancient Greece, could actually mean to be angry, but it could also mean to be joyful. It depended on the context. So in the first context I read to you, what was the thymos? It was the anger. The crowd is stirred into passionate anger. They want to kill somebody. They're so worked up. They're so frustrated and disappointed and so disturbed by what they're seeing. Their anger has taken over, not just the anger of one person, but what the anger of the whole crowd. But when we come to Acts chapter 1, this word appears again. The disciples are in that prayer meeting and they have homothimodon. They have a passion that is what the same in each person. So we have opposite meanings, but the only thing that is common is this notion of passion. The Apostle Paul was a man who understood human nature. He understood what it meant to be a person outside of Christ and he knew what it meant to be a person who have, has come into an experience of Christ. He knew that there was a nature that he had prior to meeting Christ that was self-driven, that was motivated by the passions of his own being and he used the word flesh. He said, before I came to Christ, Christ my own flesh ruled me. And it drove me to do things that I was passionate about. And one of the things he was passionate about was persecuting Christians. It fired him up. It, 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 he was so angry about what he thought they were doing that was wrong that he was out to persecute them and to kill them. And he knew that passion and he knew it was of the flesh. It was that sinful nature inside of him that drove him to do these things. Imagine then when it's joined together with others feeling the same thing. We have the story of Acts chapter 19 and the crowd at that amphitheater. Joined together by their compassion. And then Paul meets the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he has this incredible experience that he's struggling to understand. How could he have got it so wrong? How could what he had been so passionate about actually be passionate in the wrong direction? And he's turned around so that he's now walking in a different direction because Christ has come upon him. And he's now filled with the Spirit of God and a new passion takes over. And so Paul understood this really well. He understood that inside of any person there's a tension between passions. And if you read the book of Romans in chapter 7 and 8, he talks about those things. 
He talks about his own struggle internally, that, that there's this pull for him to, to, to go to his own passion and be selfish. And on the other hand, there's this pull to be drawn into Christ and to do the things the Spirit calls him to do. And he talks about these things in the book of Galatians. And I want to come across now into Galatians chapter 5. And maybe it will help you get a good sense of this as it's expressed in Galatians and chapter 5. Because he talks about what the spirit of the person does versus what the spirit, the Holy Spirit does. So reading Acts chapter 5 and starting at verse 16. So I say to you, live by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature or as he called it, the flesh. For the sinful nature of flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. And they are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you look at those lists of words, many of them have got that sense of somebody who is angry inside. And then we come across to the next list. But the fruit, the outcome, the overflow, the outworking of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things, there is no law. What do you see in that list? A joyful heart, a peaceful heart, a heart that wants to work in good accord with others. And so here's Paul, who can see a crowd that's angry and upset, and he knows that's the sinful nature. But he also knows Christ. And he knows the followers of Christ who have experienced the Spirit of God and when the Spirit comes and when we allow the Spirit to rule in us, what does it produce? Does it produce anger? Does it produce bitterness? Does it produce discord? Not at all. It produces peace and joy and connection. And so these are the things that Paul has called his people, those who named themselves as Christians. But you know, the interesting thing about this word homothumadon is it's not an action of the individual. It's an action of the body. It's an action of a group of people. And so Paul can see the difference between one group of people that are fired up by anger that leads to great destruction and great anger and enmity and and discord. And he sees those people who drew him in and loved him when he had been destroying them, who gave him a chance and enabled him to hear and understand what it meant to be a Christian. And so I ask you, not just as individual Christians, but as the body of Christ connected to the church called Gateway Baptist Church. What's the Spirit of God doing in you? You see, we can want to personalise that. Oh, this is what the Spirit's done in me. These are the wonderful experiences I've had. These are the sorts of blessings I've received. And that's all good. But God is bigger than just the individual because his heart is for the church and the church is when he gathers his people together. And when he gathers together, his spirit flows, not in you alone, but he flows in us corporately. And what he wants to produce, and this word is used ten times in the book of Acts. I I think I had a list of the occurrences of where this um, word is used. I'm not sure we can get that. Here we go. So the ones in green, can you imagine which which form of homothumadon they are? They're the godly ones. They're the ones where there is joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness of God's people. And the ones in red are those where the crowd has gathered in anger and wants to destroy something. And so I ask you the question, which one's at work in you? 
to remember what Paul said about himself. He knew there was tension. Even when he had come to Christ, there was the temptation to go back to the old and to feed the old and to walk in the old. And the danger for us in the life of the church is that when something gets up our craw, we can let it settle in and it becomes like a root of bitterness, the scripture says, and takes us on a pathway that is far from godly. So God is looking for his people always to come to him under the shadow of the cross, knowing that that the death of Jesus was accompanied by the resurrection of Jesus. And if you read Romans, it says, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is the spirit who is at work raising you to life as well. And so my, I, I, this, is, this is the thing that was weighing heavy on my spirit. As, as I'm having conversations with Pastor Jeremy and I know some of the things that have happened in his own world in recent days and I'm listening to this word and I felt like the Lord was saying, Frank, you need to have the opportunity to preach this into, in, into this body and ask that question, are we going to be people of the spirit who join together in the spirit and walk in the spirit and worship in the spirit and pray in the spirit, who serve in the spirit and serve together in the spirit? And are we going to put aside those things that would drive us to feel upset or disappointed or distressed and allow those things to take us deeper into the flesh that will not build up but will destroy? And Paul said, you've got to crucify those things. You've got to put them to death. They will not build. They will not edify. My final passage for today is found also in the book of Acts. It's in Acts chapter 20 where Paul himself Issues a warning. You see, not far from Ephesus, there was a little town called Miletus. And Miletus is actually on the shores of the Aegean Sea in just Ephesus, just a little inland. And there's this spot, and Rosalie and I actually drove in a bus through this place. And as we drove there, I remember thinking, this is the place where Paul addressed the elders of the Ephesian church. And this is what he said to them, knowing that he was seeing them for the last time. Reading from verse 13, we went, went on ahead to the ship and sailed to Assos. And when we were going to take, uh, where we were going to take Paul on board, he had made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. And we met it, when he met us at Athos, we took him aboard and went on to Mytilene. The next day we set sail and arrived at Chios. The day after we crossed over to Samos, and Samos is the island offshore there. And on the following day at Miletus, Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus, avoiding spending time in the province of Asia or Turkey, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church and when they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first time I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with, with humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you and have taught you publicly from house to house. I have declared to you both Jews and Greeks that you must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worthy of nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. And I want to ask you this question. What does your pastor do? Aren't these like a very paragraph that describes the heart of your pastor? a man who has the gospel at heart, who's keen for people to see faith, who has a determined to finish the race doing that very thing. Now I know that, that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you that today I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. There was a moment where I sensed the Spirit of God saying, let me come and let me join you 
in what you're doing. As a young man, I was still at university. I went to a convention in Sydney. It was the very first charismatic convention that was held in Australia. And I had just freshly had a a sense of being baptised in the Holy Spirit. For the first time, prayed in tongues and had visions and prophetic words. And I went to this conference and there were people from all different denominations across Australia. I remember sitting in one row and there were three Catholic nuns sitting alongside of me. There were Lutherans and Catholics and Anglicans and people from Pentecostal churches, just people from our churches. And as we worshipped together, there were moments where simply the Spirit took over the worship and the homothumadon of the Spirit was there, the common passion for him to sing and to worship him. I really want to encourage you, church, that I know it's in the hearts of your worship and I know it's in the heart of your pastor to embrace this sense of allowing the Spirit to come and to flow and to be a part of your worship. We've got a beautiful song that we're going to finish with. I don't know where this is going to go, but I'm going to hand that over to Joe. She knows what I'm talking about. Let's just let the Spirit of God rule and reign even as we worship. Well, that is all from us. We hope you enjoyed that sermon today. We just want to encourage you, if you can jump on our YouTube channel right now, click on the subscribe button or on the like button. That will give you all the latest content. Why don't you also share that message with somebody today? We can't wait to see you next week. Don't forget, 10 a.m. See you then.